Good morning, this is David, the Georgia Photographer, and today what I'm going to do is a commentary video. It's not more of a reaction video as it's commentary over a video from a popular YouTuber I recently watched. Okay, this YouTuber is Thomas Heaton, and he done a video about whether or not you should get into YouTube in 2024. You see these videos pretty often. But what this one caught me as is number one, it's in the same space as me. And number two, his story is very different than mine. So, and it has a lot of parallels. So I wanna kind of like put some commentary over this video so that, you know, if you are getting into YouTube in 2024, there are some caveats. He doesn't mention them because he didn't experience them. His, his YouTube journey is drastically different than mine. So with that, let's get into this. I'm gonna just crank this up here. Towards the end of this year, I will have been on this platform for 10 years. <laughs> it's just terrifying. But I thought this would be an appropriate time for me to make a video offering some advice to photographers who want to start a YouTube channel or perhaps who already have a YouTube channel and would like to progress. So that Okay, to, to be perfectly honest here, I've only been on the platform for seven years so i am a little junior to him as far as time but i'm seven years in so um bear that in mind there is no doubt in my mind that without youtube i would not be where i am today i would be completely unknown because 10 years ago nobody knew my name nobody saw my photographs maybe i'd get a few hundred views on Flickr, but that was it. Now I had a dream, a dream, a dream of travel in the world, photographing landscapes for a living, publishing images in magazines and books around the- To be fair, I had a little bit of this too. And this is a, this is a common theme. Um, when I got into it, I started the channel for one reason. And it was because I had broke my foot and I was gonna document the journey to recovery. Well, that kind of went away pretty quick because that wasn't a really interesting journey at all, just to tell you the truth. My foot got better and it's better now. <laughs> but the ultimately, it kind of morphed into what he just said was it was it was kind of it was kind of fun in the beginning just to play with the idea of making videos and uploading them. And at the time, let me just, just switch back over to me for a minute. At the time, what I was dealing with was Peter McKinnon syndrome because he was exploding. And of course, you think that that's the norm when you see every week he's got another hundred or two thousand subscribers and thinking, man, this YouTube thing must be pretty easy, you know? And come to find out it's not it's not at all don't be misled that whole that whole success thing because it looks easy is bogus nothing is like that that i have found okay nothing so anyway he he's spot on with that so let's get back to it globe and live in this adventurous and vagabond lifestyle and actually if i step back and look at my life it's not too far off and that is all 100% down to this platform. So how would photographers benefit from having a YouTube channel? Now, I'm not saying that all photographers should have a YouTube channel, far from it. Like landscape photography in particular, it's a very intrinsic thing. It's a very personal experience and you might not want to pollute that with the pressure of sharing every single aspect of what you do. So this is a good point he's about to bring up what um because i've not watched it through and he's he's about to talk about something very valuable here and he's already alluded to it so pay attention oh well, if you do landscape photography for very personal reasons then keep it that way there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but if you want to grow an audience and have your work viewed by many more people from around the world then a youtube channel has to be one of the most powerful ways of doing that because not only do you share your work you share yourself you're sharing so much more now you see what he's talking about he's he had he's good at this he's a real good visual storyteller a, a very good one and what he has done is he shifted from being a photographer to be a cinematographer there's the shift and it happened in that dialogue 
more than just an image. You're sharing an entire story around the image. You're sharing helpful tips and advice. You're inspiring people and people are getting to know the photographer behind the image. So your work, your photography, not only gets an audience, it gets an engaged captive audience. And I think there's so much more value in that than perhaps mm. in some cases where people just see an image on a screen and they might say, wow, that is an incredible image. Now, he's right, of course, I agree with this part. And the point is, is that if you watch this video all the way through, it's the point here is, is that he's, he's attracted He's attracted viewers that are interested in the same genre of photography as he is. So now he's got an audience that enjoys these types of photos already. And he doesn't have to go out and find people and curate his work in areas and figure it all out. The people have come to him. But then they move on. There's, they, they lack that connection with the photographer, the artist behind the work. And that is where YouTube comes in and creates that powerful connection. Now, once you have a captive audience, of course, you're then in a position to be able to make a living and effectively live your dream, just like I'm doing. Get out, do what you love and make that your living. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. All right. To be fair here, I don't know how many subscribers or views because you get paid on views. You don't get paid on subscribers, but subscribers typically shows how powerful or strong or interested your channel is to others or whatever, but it's, it's not as valuable of a metric anymore as views. So if I don't know how many views a video has to get for it to become a, a revenue stream big enough to where you can live your dream as he says right here but for me i make anywhere from 45 to 70 dollars a month that's it and i have made 45 to 70 dollars a month for three or four years now it hasn't went up at all it, seriously i mean i mean i need to look at the the history on that and see if i can verify that but but yeah it fifty dollars a month you can't live anywhere on earth that i'm aware of on fifty dollars a month maybe there's some places there, there possibly is but not in the united states or the united kingdom I, I guarantee you you can't do it in those two countries so to get to that level takes years of being an effective youtuber not an effective photographer there's he's doing two different jobs very well here okay one he's a very he's a very well accomplished landscape photographer he he has an eye for it and he takes beautiful landscape photos and two he is a very very good youtube content creator okay he he makes amazing videos for youtube that people just enjoy watching he has a very specific style that people enjoy seeing so knowing that people want to watch his videos well if you are good at storytelling like he is and he has apparently done enough research to understand what it takes to make an effective youtube video for people to enjoy it because he he touches on that a little bit in the future but it's um it's two different jobs and he kind of touches he gets into that a little bit as much as i whinge and moan on this channel it's a beautiful thing. All right, let's just jump into the meat of this. Some tips and advice for photographers out there who either have a YouTube channel and want it to grow or are thinking of starting one. The first thing I would say is it's never too late. I started my channel when I was 30. As I explained earlier, I was nothing, nobody, no one knew who I was. Now, I think that you're never too old and it's never too late because the audience for photography, especially landscape photography and wildlife photography, it's a more mature audience. YouTube is not a young person person's game. Far from it. My mum and dad are never off YouTube. My wife's parents, all that is to distinguish between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Point here is, is that he's trying to tell you, if you want to do a channel, start one. 
okay i'm gonna skip ahead past this little section because the, otherwise this video is going to be two hours long but he 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 makes a good point you know if you want to do a channel do a channel it's never too late just the best as they say the best time to plant a tree in your yard a fruit tree is 15 years ago the second best time is right now so if you want to do a channel get on youtube and set one up i mean just have some fun with it but yeah let's skip on to the next part here between what is a photography shoot and what is a video shoot. What I mean by that is if you wanna go out and make an in the field YouTube video about your photography, you need to tell yourself, this is not a photography shoot. This is a video shoot. That little switch, that mindset switch is incredibly valuable. Now the way it works is that if you're thinking I'm out on a photography shoot and I've got my camera, I'm gonna take some landscapes and whilst I'm here, I may as well make a video. What's gonna happen is you'll probably begin the video recording when your camera's set up and you'll share a few behind the scenes images, a bit of B-roll and then the photograph. The problem with that is it's not captivating, it's not engaging, you're missing so many. You see all the push-ins and stuff that he does? I never do those and I think that's part of the cinematography thing that he's learned. He doesn't allow more than six or seven seconds to pass in his video before something changes and i never do that and it's pretty evident um, you look at my channel's metrics you look at his you can see very clearly he has studied cinematography implicitly to be a more effective youtube content creator and that's the point he's making here is the point i failed to do the whole time and that's, you, if you're gonna make YouTube videos, learn to be a cinematographer. If you're gonna be a photographer, learn to be a photographer. And you have to, if you wanna be a effective YouTuber, you gotta learn both in the photography space, of course. You know, if you're in, if you're in classic cars, just learn cinematography and cars. You, but you get the point. He, he mentions that in a little future, in a little further down. But, but yeah, the point here, that he's trying to make is valid and and it's very it's very it's something i didn't learn any opportunities whereas if you'd woke up in the morning picked up your camera bag and said right today is a video shoot not a photography shoot you're then in the frame of mind to start telling so much more of the story the video shoot doesn't begin when the camera's set up on the tripod the video shoot begins perhaps the day before when you're being inspired or checking the weather to go out and shoot you're thinking about how can this process how can i help the viewer how can i do the very best to share this experience that i'm having when i take this image so when you think from a video creator standpoint you're almost stepping back and you're looking at the bigger picture you're editing the video in your mind long before you get the camera out of your bag to take photographs so just having that mindset switch of i'm here to do a job and that job is to make a video uh okay and he waffles on for a few more minutes about that i'm gonna jump to the next section will hear it a lot and that is just consistency if you're gonna start a youtube channel or continue and want to grow a youtube channel you have to commit and i would recommend committing to one year's worth of weekly uploads okay he's about to say something here that i don't agree with okay because i have seen plenty of other content creators such as the photographic eye and and people in other spaces entirely that do not upload weekly that have wildly successful youtube channels i genuinely believe that if the video is made correctly in other words it's compelling it tells a good story it has good cinematography and it has good audio the audio is way more important than you think that's why this mic is here because without good audio people won't watch I can't stand a video with a hot mic where you can hear all of the little picky enunciations in the high frequency range, like like you can hear them spitting and all that, you know, the real sharp edge of the P and, you know, and the t in the T, I can't stand those sounds. So if a video has got such a hot mic that they've got that high frequency pushed up that high, I click off. I just won't watch it. I'll hunt somebody else's video. It's audio is, is crazy important, 
anyway he's about to say that you need to video you need to upload on a very consistent schedule i i don't think that a video a week is the right schedule for everybody okay whatever works for you and your lifestyle you know if you're jumping into this pool and you're gonna do this for a job say you say you are recently unemployed and you have an opportunity because you're in the united states they call it unemployment and you and you want to try youtube and see if you can be a content creator and you've got a little window there where you can upload regularly do what you want upload every day if you want um, tim childers is doing a video a day on a channel he's just created just to do it you know but uh, if you build a video that has all of the elements of a quality story that people want to see then it doesn't matter if you upload once a week or once a month or once every three months people are going to watch it so that's 52 videos if you can commit to 52 videos then you have a good chance of then continuing on and succeeding now that's not easy but if you love what you do it's a heck of a lot easier than doing something that you don't enjoy Sorry. which nicely brings me on to the next piece of advice which is to do youtube videos for the right reasons now that's going to be different for okay he's about to get into a part you need to pay attention to everybody i would say if you're doing youtube specifically to make money then photography landscape photography in particular is not a good niche to be in it's got a pretty low ceiling you know you might want to do health and fitness or food or it's a low ceiling he's got six hundred and fifty thousand subscribers um yeah who is it um, ted forbes is like on a million or close to it yeah yeah low ceiling motor vehicles they have much bigger audiences mm -hmm. finance anything you make a lot of money doing that i'm sure so if you're doing photography it has to be because you're passionate about photography and if you are passionate about photography then you won't get sick of making youtube videos especially if when you go out to make a youtube video you do it to serve the audience don't chase algorithms don't chase views just ask yourself okay i'm gonna stop him for a second I did this, okay? I did exactly what he just said. I didn't chase the algorithm, and I did it because I loved doing it, and it got me nowhere, okay? Seven years in, my channel has 5,400, 5,500, I don't know exactly. Um, it ain't even 6,000 subscribers, seven years in. I'm not really expecting to see the other 640 something thousand subs that he has in the next three years. At the rate of growth, my channel is growing, which is 50 or 60 subscribers a month. It won't be, it will be sometime 400 years from now before I see that kind of channel size. The point is, is that if you do it for these right reasons, it doesn't work. Don't fall for that. You need to learn how YouTube works. That matters way more than he's alluding to. Like your thumbnail matters. It matters a lot. Mr. Beast, everything about a Mr. Beast video is very deliberate and it's tuned specifically for the YouTube platform. And, you know, they're everything. So the content, the way it happens, the way you tell the story, there's there's sections of the video that matters more than others. You know, the audience retention. If you if you don't retain the audience to a certain point, YouTube doesn't recommend the video to others. And the algorithm does all that math in the background. And you know, yeah, the right reasons are you need to know how to do YouTube, not just because you like doing it and you ain't going to chase the algorithm, because I tried that and it didn't work. One question, how can I add value to the person watching this video? Now that value can come. I did that too. That was why I got into reviewing gear, because that's the low hanging fruit in the photography space. If you want to jump into that pool, 
the easiest way in is to review cameras and lenses and things like that. Typically, cameras and lenses will get you the most views. And if you look at my channel's analytics, all the views on my channel pretty much are about cameras and lenses, not the videos where I go on photo walks or I talk about this or that. The ones like this one probably won't get many views. This is just the way it is. But the review videos of lenses get thousands and thousands of views. These videos that I do that are alternative in the space, and he gets into that later, which kind of makes me wonder how he successfully does it, but I'm pretty sure it's because he's a good visual storyteller. But he, um, he says that, you know, well, just watch. Come in the form of inspiration, entertainment, comedic value, or education, anything. Lots of different ways to add value. But if you're going out to make a video to either make money, get views, like maybe you've seen a video, uh, there's a trend and there's a thumbnail and it's blowing up and you think, I'm going to make a video just like that with that title and that thumbnail and it's going to get loads of views. I just, I just wouldn't bother. I would just think, how can I serve the audience? And that foundation of serving the audience will set you up beautifully for a long and sustainable career on this platform. Now it's difficult, but try not to worry about views. Try not to worry about making money. It's so really important to have realistic <laughs> expectations. Like I'm never going to get a million subscribers, I don't think. I'm just not on track to hit a million subscribers, maybe in, gosh, 15, 20 years or something. And I think that's okay because I don't have ambitions to be a millionaire. I don't have ambitions to become world famous. My only goal with this channel really is to make it sustainable. I've always- Mine was too. I wanted it to finance itself and it hasn't done that. I wanted it to generate enough revenue that I was able to, because I was doing vintage lens reviews and they're not very expensive, but the videos have generated almost enough money to pay for about a third of the gear I've bought to review in those review videos. So you just bear that in mind. Um, there, are, there are less ethical ways to do that Amazon is one of them. People will buy something from Amazon. I've seen this as reason I know. I've never done it. Fair enough, to be fair. But it it is a thing. People will do this. They'll order a piece of gear from Amazon, use it, review it. You got 30 days, so they'll use it and review it, and then they'll just send it back to Amazon after they get their video. And it's an easy way to basically capitalize on... Amazon's ability to just mail order a piece of equipment and you not have to be financially responsible for keeping it. It's, it's, uh, it's a way a lot of people operate. Um, I don't. Like right behind this camera is 40 lenses that I've bought over the years and I've sold a bunch of them. <laughs> Robert's camera has bought a bunch of my vintage lenses because I just don't shoot on them. I've, these are mostly the ones I like to use. So I keep, I keep them around. But anyway, the point is that I wanted my channel to do what he just said, which is be sustainable. And it's not. He said that I would much rather have steady growth like this than bang, a big spike. And then all over the place. Like for me, just consistency chipping away one bit at a time over a long period. Absolutely. So once your channel starts to become successful and you start getting consistent views and consistent numbers, then you may have the opportunity to take on board sponsorships. Now, hands up, this video is sponsored, but the advice. Okay. He's getting into a section of YouTube space that I am not familiar with because my channel doesn't have enough subscribers or whatever, or weekly views or whatever metrics that sponsors are looking for. I get emails where people want to give me a piece of kit to review. I get those emails. And usually they're from China and they're poorly worded. And a lot of them have real like strict rules about the video and how it has to be made for some little free light stand or or a, a video light or something. You know, you they'll be, but, and I normally turn most of that away. I have done a couple like the 35f 0.95 ttrs and lens they gave me that lens to review it 
I haven't heard from them since. And they've dropped, they've dropped a ton of lenses since then. So most likely, I was a dead end in their opinion. And <laughs> I didn't, I have, I've emailed them once or twice about a couple of other lenses that came out. Crickets, I don't hear from them anymore. So, you know, that's why you don't see me doing those kind of videos, but I don't have, like, I don't know how much they make on sponsored videos, and I don't understand that, and I haven't gotten to that point. And so, this part, I really don't know anything about. The advice I'm going to give you is relevance, and that is to only consider sponsors who are relevant to your audience, sponsors that can actually help that your makes audience. Sense. Like, it's no good me having this channel sponsored by a, a bed company <laughs> for your mattresses, because, like, who cares? So, right. in this instance, this video is sponsored by MPB, and now I'm going to do my bit. Much. Yeah, we're going to skip okay, the bit. Okay, so another piece of <laughs> advice that I would give to a photographer beginning a YouTube channel or who's new into having a YouTube channel, and that is to pick a niche. Of course, pick a niche, but don't be afraid to mix it up. Now, what I've noticed with my videos, if I have three or four videos on the trot that are the same, so let's say, for example, I go to Iceland and I release four videos from Iceland, the views consistently, week and week, go down, 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 down. This happens. I've seen the same exact thing. Like I make many series of trips. Like we went to England last year in June and I hiked the Pilgrim's Way, which is the the path that the people from the the story the Canterbury Tales walk from Winchester, England to Canterbury, England. And I made that I broke that trip up into like three videos, I think. The first week got a lot of views and just exactly like he said the second video got less and the third video got less it's like people people lose interest really quick the attention span or the interest span i guess could be it is is much different now than it was when we were kids and you wanted to see the next installment of a documentary it happens all the time and what this tells me is that the audience wants variety so if you can mix it up as much as possible whilst maintaining your content within that niche you know and you can you can branch off from the niche so your my niche is landscape photography but i'm not afraid to branch off and do wildlife or a bit of urban photography or a gear review or a video like this about youtube as long as it's all still you know, strongly connected to that landscape photography niche. And I find that by mixing it up and dropping an in the field video one week, a review video the next week, back in the field the other week, a road trip video the week after that, a travel video the week after that, then it just keeps things fresh. It's all still within my niche, but it's not repetitive. Think about how you can vary your content as much as possible. Wow. Yeah. Now, to be fair here, I do that and it's only because I like doing it. I didn't do it to pull audience retention, but I, over the years I have noticed it. Like I said with the England thing, I've done a, a couple of other trips where I've done that and, I, and you can see it, but I've only done it three or four times over my entire seven years of making videos. But honestly, there are there are things this is why i like matt Irwin does knock on gear and knock on corporate talk videos where he talks about the latest releases that's why everybody you see that's ultra popular in the space 99 percent of them are gearheads they all talk about the gear people love to watch videos about it i don't know why they do it's just a fact and the rare youtuber who doesn't like do gear reviews relentlessly but has content like thomas here um they they know cinematography in such a way that they can tell a compelling story and you want to see it that that's the magic is to tell the compelling story and some people this guy included don't really know how to do that well I'm going to skip up to the next section because he just continues to talk about that for a minute. 
in that bubble. Now this wouldn't be one of my videos if we weren't to go ahead and look at the negatives with having a YouTube channel. Now the negative that I'm gonna talk about is one that I'm sure affects a lot of people. And that is, it's basically it's placing your personal self-worth on your YouTube channel, right? When I release or upload a video and it does not perform well, it's horrible. It's a horrible feeling. Even if I know the video is good and the video is original and it's the best content I've made, if it doesn't perform well, it absolutely ruins my day. It can ruin. I'll be honest with you. I used to have this problem. And after a certain point, I got to where I just didn't care because none of the videos perform well coming out of the shoot for me. They, they just kind of, they just kind of trickle along and the videos that have thousands of views, typically it's because of longevity. People are searching for lens reviews for a Nikon 28 millimeter lens and they find my 28 millimeter lens review and they watch it. And you know, I posted that video four or five years ago and just through sheer attrition, it's accumulated a lot of views. And I, all of my uploads, uh, I have a I have a devout audience, and those are the those two or three hundred viewers will see this video, and the rest the rest of YouTube won't click on it. That's what's going to happen here, and I know it, and I just don't care anymore. And probably because I've lost that desire that he's talked about, how he's been utterly devastated. That is a motivating tool for him to do something better the next time. To to move on from that video which didn't do well maybe analyze it and try to figure out why it didn't work yeah because that's part of being a youtuber is figuring out why it didn't work i didn't do that and i've gotten to the point where i just don't care and because of that i believe it makes my video quality suffer and you know i can be honest with you guys because all 300 of you that's going to see this video or 200 know at this point that it just doesn't matter to me if anybody sees it or not in my week every time i get a video that's way below average i think well this is it this is the end of my channel it's all over i've got no control what was i thinking and trying to control that negativity and those negative thoughts it's a difficult thing to do. It's something that I'm working on every day, always trying to get better. And it never really, it never ha, it's only, it's fairly recent. Like for many years, I had slow, steady growth, consistent growth. And then I believe in, I think 2021, I think it was beginning of 21, there was a noticeable, obvious crash in my channel where overnight. I'm pretty sure there was that YouTube done some kind of, um like algorithmic update because I'm pretty sure that was the time when like a lot of YouTubers saw this. Um, I don't remember exactly if it, how it affected me, but over the years, if you do YouTube for a number of years, you, you'll see things happen where they make changes to the back end of YouTube. And a lot of it affects the money. Like they'll change the way they pay or the way they measure the monetization ability like when i first got into youtube they measured how you got monetized one way and then like a year later they changed that rule and i didn't meet the qualifications they cut my money off until i met the new qualifications and they turned it back on and you know, it's like there's constantly being updates done and it's so youtube stays relevant as a platform so they have to do these things but yeah I'm pretty sure what he's talking about happened to way more people than just him. My views halved. Why this happened, who knows? A change in the algorithm, mm -hmm. a change in viewer interests, my audience, they're always changing, recycling, so the people watching my videos today are not the same as the people who were watching them five years ago. So perhaps I lost some people there. I don't know, but it was noticeable and it took me, it was like the stock market crashing and then it took a year to recover. One year, all of 2022, took me to recover to get back to the numbers that I was getting at the end of 2021, I think. Um, it was a hard year and I don't talk about it. I don't tell anyone about it. I just go on, plug away, head down. He literally just did tell somebody about it. <laughs> I just caught that keep doing what I'm doing, keep those core principles about serving the audience and just 
continue on. And thankfully, my channel has recovered and is just continuing that slow, steady growth. Um, but just be aware, it's hard. Like, like generally putting yourself out there every week and then, you know, it's hard not to take it personally when things don't perform. So I would... Yeah, and now he's about to start his closing. I'm, um, I'm going to stop his commentary there and just talk to you for a minute. He's, uh, he's made some very valid points here. But for me, I have learned. I'm just going to go ahead and wrap it up with, with my thoughts on how if you're going to start a YouTube channel, this, this is the advice I would give you. One, watch videos on cinematography and lighting and audio. Watch those videos. Like, watch how to be creative with cameras. Things like where you can use, where you can stick GoPros to get alternative angles. Like, there, there's a classic one of, I think it's Peter McKinnon, where he takes a GoPro and puts it down in the, the bottom of like a, a coffee thing like this. Or it might be the canister. And he and he opens it to get to reach in and, and scoop the beans, you know, and and the, the view is up out of the canister. That's a pretty creative shot, and it's pretty iconic. But you know, things like that, and understand cinematography and and visual storytelling, and how to generate scripts and things like that. Um, you got you need to learn all of that, and you can be making videos in the meantime, but don't expect much from them. Okay, and then you need to learn all the stuff about the visual storytelling and all of that jazz, you know. And of course, he's he is right about picking a niche and, and kind of sticking with it. Uh, variety channels can be successful, but ultimately, they're niche channels, niche, 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 whatever the word is, because the variety channels aren't about the variety of content, they're about the person. And that person is a very narrow niche. So if you look at it from the right lens, they're, they're niching down too. So the point is, is that if you want to do a channel, do one. It doesn't cost you nothing. They don't charge you to have a channel. So start one. You can make your videos on your phone, upload them with it. It's easy. It really is. You know, and if you want to be good at YouTube though, you have to study it a little bit. You have to understand um, certain things about it. The fact that YouTube is nothing more than a video search engine. So if you don't put keywords audibly in the dialogue, oops, sorry about that, as well as written in the descriptions and things like that, then YouTube can't index your video as a searchable term. So that's why you'll see a lot of YouTubers say a specific product over and over and over in the video because YouTube looks for those audio cues to feed that data. That gum, getting all these notifications. Anyway, with that, this is David, the Georgia photographer, and I appreciate you watching. But if you haven't seen this video without all of, the, all of my interruptions, it's It'd be worth it for you to go over to his channel and give it a watch and just watch it straight through because it's a good video and he tells a good story and he tells you a good perspective of YouTube and how to do it if you want to be really successful from his point of view. So with that, I'm going to talk to you soon and y'all take care and good night. Bye bye.